But don't do it again. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, uh, I am uh, Nothing Face, and um, this is a talk about automotive networks. Um, a little overview. No, it's not. Is this um, a little uh, overview of um, what the talk is going to be about. Um, going to give a little brief background about myself, um, give you some perspective about, I get some idea of my perspective and, um, you know, just give you an idea of where my, you know, the ideas that, um, that I'm coming up with may or may not be um, based on um, my strengths and weaknesses. Um, give you a little idea of what, how this could be relevant to you, um, depending on your level of interest in hacking an automobile. Um, there, there's some things that may be interesting to you, even if you aren't interested in hacking an automobile, just to learn about the operation and understand what's going on. Um, give a little bit of background on the uh, electronics and automobiles. Um, and then um, a large part will be about OBD2, it's Onboard Diagnostics 2. Um, that's a, um, a standard used commonly today. Um, talk a little bit about common places that that's used, um, the physical and data link layer, um, trying to adhere somewhat to the OSI model of networking. Um, talk about some of the diagnostic modes that that specifies, um, some products that implement it. Um, and then I'll conclude with an introduction to uh, some software I've been working on to implement these protocols and um, serve as a platform for others to develop other applications. Uh, so about the speaker, um, I'm educated in electrical and computer engineering. Um, I have professional experience in hardware and software design, um, but I'm, a, I'm also a Saturday afternoon mechanic, so um, I'm not afraid of grease or wrench, but I'm also not a mechanical engineer, so um, the automotive um, Automotive engineering aspects uh, are where um, aren't so much um, my strengths, but um, my hope is to be able to put tools in the hands of those who are uh, more able to uh, make those types of uh, automotive engineering decisions and, and tinker with their vehicles. And I'm also concerned about privacy. And as you'll see, there's um, a number of aspects of the um, buses and the uh, networks on the vehicle that um, could potentially have privacy implications. So why? Uh, why should you out there in the audience care? Um, well, the automotive maintenance monopoly is um, probably the big reason. Um, for, for automobiles, you can get service manuals that provide mechanical drawings with a um, great deal of accuracy for all the mechanical components in a vehicle, every bolt, every nut, all the torque specifications, all that. But um, for as far as electronics go, um, generally this, the, um, the best you can get is a wiring diagram that tells you where the wires in the vehicle go to hook up one box to another, but each box is a black box. There's no schematics of the boards. There's no source code to the firmware. Um, you know, there's there's limited protocol specifications. So there's no way to really do the same thing you can do with an engine with the computer that controls the engine. And um, particularly um, from my background, I think that that's uh, very limiting because I'd like to be able to uh, tinker around with that. So um, a lot of this is more reverse engineering to sort of try to gain that that knowledge from a vehicle. Um, there's also privacy implications, even if you're not interested in uh, tinkering with a vehicle. Um, there are things that a vehicle could potentially be recording with a lot of electronics on there. It could be recording, storing, transmitting data about your driving, about your vehicle, and, and all sorts of information about the uh, driver of the vehicle. Um, and so, you know, considering all these things, the vehicle, modern vehicles tend to be more under the control of a manufacturer than the owner. And there's um, some barriers put in place to prevent you from being able to control that, which um, which a lot of people may object to. I personally do. Um, so, um, automobile electronics. What? Um, where did that come from? Well, initially it started um, so originally under the hood, just uh, controlling fuel injectors, analog brakes, traction control, airbags. Um, you know, performing some of the um, more advanced functions that um, were. And a long time ago, done by mechanical or electromechanical systems, but um, as re federal requirements got more um, got more strict, and also as the systems got more complex, the need was to make it more of a software type system with a um, software control system. Um, there's also user visible um, systems as uh, you know electronics becoming um, cheaper and more used. They're used for climate control, entertainment, navigation, communications, um, and so. Um, onboard Diagnostic Standard, OBD, or OBD-1, um, was an uh, early standard by the federal government in the United States to um, standardize on some of these um, electronics. Um, but they didn't, the standardization only went so far, and it didn't actually require the manufacturers to standardize a particular implementation. It just said certain functionality was required. So that um, led to a number of um, disparate implementations in the field. So 
every manufacturer had a different test box that you need to you need to get a specific one for a specific vehicle um, to perform the same functions. Um, so onboard diagnostics two um, is a standard standardized implementation that said not only do you have to do particular features, but you have to do them in a particular way so that you can have interoperable products where you can um, you can get a test box outside the vehicle to plug it into any vehicle and it will communicate with it and you can also get um, replacement parts for certain uh, pieces in the vehicle but, um, actually I'm going to um, save questions till the end if that's right um, oh sorry um, so OBD OBD one um, was early 90s um, is when it was uh, standardized or when it was um, required OBD2 was mandated in 1996, um, and that's current in all vehicles nowadays. There's sort of a little bit of slop in the in the time frame in which they um, they're implemented. The um, the federal government said vehicles starting in '96 have to have them, but they don't actually have to be fully functional until 2000 or 1999. So um, there's some you know variance in what actually has been implemented, um, and there's some discussion about what's the future um, for. OBD3, so I'll get to that a little bit in the future as well. Um, so, so the current standard um, is OBD2. Um, it's standardized by SAE, um, and, it, and the standard covers covers a physical connector. Um, all vehicles have to have one single, the same single physical connector. Um, it, it covers a data link layer. Uh, there's three options where any one vehicle, any vehicle has to have one of the three options, um, and there's a standard network protocol that's run on top of all the data link layers. Um, it also standardized diagnostics um, by which there's certain procedures and um, mechanisms required for diagnosing troubleshooting a vehicle. Um, only the diagnostics that relate to emissions control systems by U.S. federal law um, under EPA legislation are really required. Um, the scope of the, the standard covers um, the ability to use this bus for other purposes. Um, so there's, there's room in the standard to support um, you know, standard common components and manufacturer specific components, but those aren't required by the federal law. Um, there's also many, many packet formats and data types for diagnostic data. Um, again, there's a variety of them that um, only a few of them are specifically required, but um, for manufacturers that want to, don't want to duplicate efforts and have a separate diagnostic bus for all the things that are not required, they can just use the same bus for all of their specific proprietary um, parts. Um, OBD2 also specifies a mechanism to read and write the uh, ECU memory. Um, ECU, there's two term, there's two um, definitions for that acronym. Um, originally, it stands for engine control unit, but now it's often used to mean electronic control unit, which can control things other than the engine, such as anti-lock brakes or airbags or um, climate control or any any of those black boxes could be a ECU, an electronic control unit. So. Um, since they have microcontrollers or more functional processors and memory, you can read and write the memory um, with OBD um, message um, network messages. And there's also a security feature um, to allow um, particularly either proprietary or, um, or uh, safety-related features to be um, to be protected by a security feature that requires um, certain knowledge of the vehicle before you say reprogram your anti-lock brakes or your um, any theft system on the vehicle, um, and that's not required, but uh, it is used by a number of manufacturers for 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 the theft control systems or anti theft systems. Um, so, common usage. This is um, the scan tool is one of the uh, very common uses of the diagnostic bus for the um, purposes as its namesake, diagnosing problems with the vehicle. Um, an ECU detects a fault condition, some problem with the vehicle as you're operating it. Um, say, for example, oxygen sensor detects a mixture too rich. So um, the, that ECU, it records a diagnostic trouble code. Um, it's basically just a, a number that um, explains more detail about what exactly is oxygen sensor 2 on bank, you know, bank 2 had a problem. Um, and when the, the diagnostic trouble code is stored, it causes the check engine light on the dashboard to illuminate. Um, some DTCs can be minor and not cause that to happen, but um, typically they cause the check engine light to illuminate so that the driver of the vehicle knows there's a problem. They take it to the mechanic. The mechanic plugs in this scan tool device. Um, it retrieves a DTC. Um, this is when people um, hear a mechanic saying they read the codes back or they scanned the codes. Um, this is the process that they're doing to um, determine what that number is and then use that to uh, 
you know, troubleshoot the problem. So then they fix the problem, and then with that scan tool, they can clear the DTC, cause the check engine light to go off, and your car is fixed. Um, another um, ca common usage of OBD2 that's only becoming um, um, put in use in the last couple of years is um, a crash data recorder. Um, now, this is a function where the uh, airbag control module senses a deployment or non-deployment events uh, event. The um, deployment events um, relate to when an airbag deploys. Um, just the, the sensors detect the acceleration of the vehicle and impact sensors and whatnot to determine that there's been a crash and it deploys the airbag to um, serve its purpose. Um, a non-deployment event is uh, an event that causes perhaps some but not all of the sensors to um, to trigger, so it doesn't actually deploy the airbag, but it's considered to be fairly significant. So that information can also be stored in the airbag controller. Um, the vehicle sensor data is stored in the airbag control module. That's where the um, actual information is stored. Um, and it can store information from other sensors that are not part of that module, including the vehicle speed, engine speed, um, throttle position, brake state, the driver's seatbelt state, whether it's engaged or not. Um, and then this information can be read back from law enforcement um, or mechanic or whatnot, you know, after the crash for analysis. Um, doesn't help in uh, troubleshooting the car because it's really just information about the crash. So um, it's more for forensic analysis of an accident, um, possibly in a, in a legal setting. Um, so if the vehicle is repaired, the uh, airbag control module is just reset or replaced. So um, getting to the OBD2 um, network. The uh, physical layer specified by OBD2 um, it specifies three diagnostic buses. There's um, little mention in OBD2 of, of other buses. I'll get to that in a bit. But the, the three main um, buses are these, these three here, the PWM pulse width modulation, the variable pulse width modulation, and the um, ISO asynchronous serial um, bus. The ISO bus is actually standardized by the um, ISO organization in Europe, um, and that's commonly used by um, European cars and uh, Japanese cars, um, but the other two are actually detailed specified in uh, OBD2, and any one of the um, three buses is required on a vehicle, and is required to use that bus for all of the federally mandated diagnostics, and commonly manufacturers then extend that functionality to every other diagnostic capability they have, because why, do, why add a second bus when you don't need to already have this one? Um, some other buses that are common in um, automobiles are uh, the CAN bus, the control area network. Um, that's a lot higher speed than the other buses on by about a factor of 10 or more. Um, and the CAN bus is typically used for real-time communication between, um, between ECUs on a vehicle, the, um, whereas the diagnostic buses are used for communicating off the vehicle to a, a scan tool or some other device plugged into the vehicle. The CAN buses are often used for communication between the airbag controller and the, the um, engine control unit at the, while you're driving the vehicle in real time to update vehicle speed or other sensor readings or um, to control systems. Um, and the CAN is more used in uh, higher end automobiles nowadays, but its use is becoming um, it's becoming more and more prevalent, and I think in the future there's going to be a lot more, um, a lot more functionality uh, available on the, the CAN bus. Um, and other buses that are um, used in, manu in uh, automobiles, um, there's manufacturer proprietary, um, there's the OBD1 buses. Like I said, that there's no standard implementation, so there's a variety of buses that are used for the OBD1 implementations, and there's also buses before OBD1 where manufacturers had um, substantial electronic control systems in a vehicle, but did not um, before there was federal requirements to have certain um, emissions control systems diagnosable from an, an off an offboard uh, controller. So um, there's a variety of those, and those are um, limited use from different manufacturers. Uh, so the data link layer um, on the um, OBD2 and the ISO bus, um, it's a um, they're all half duplex shared buses. Um, and they're all uh, carrier sense multiple access with non-destructive collisions. Um, so that, I mean, basically what that means is there's a priority in the um, header of the packet. The, um, the beginning of the packet, which specifies the message type and addressing, is allocated in such a way that the higher priority messages um, will win a contention on the bus. So you don't actually have a destructive collision that causes both packets to retry. Only the lower priority packet will retry. And this um, basically makes it such that if you have a um, a bus with a lot of traffic on it and a lot of contention, you won't um, 
you won't have zero data rate. You'll have you'll still be able to have effective communication, but um, certainly the lower priority messages may get um, delayed or not sent at all. Uh, the network layer um, is a standard um, standard across all three of the um, OBD2 buses. Um, the uh, SAE specification specifies addressing modes. Um, there's two different addressing modes: the functional and the physical. The um, the functional mode is used for um, uh, addressing a component by by its function, um, as the name says, um, and that's for the um, purposes of allowing man vehicle manufacturers to um, have freedom in the topology of how they um, lay out their ECUs. Whether a manufacturer wants to have one or two or five ECUs in a vehicle, um, they don't need to be concerned with functional addressing. You can say, um, you can ask a a component, um, you know. Which which component has the um, you know the sensors for the oxygen sensors, and you don't need to care that the one manufacturer has one ECU that controls that, and another manufacturer has five. It, it um, you'll be able to talk to all of them. So um, that's um, it's more to ease the ability of creating the uh, off-board um, diagnostics um, devices. And the physical addressing is sort of a traditional network topology where um, or a typical network addressing where every individual um, physical ECU has its own address. Um, and either can be used for a vehicle, but certainly the, the functional can be done on, um, on any vehicle um, very much the same, and physical is, um, needs specific knowledge of a particular vehicle. Um, and the network layer is also um, packet formats. <laughs> There's also um, packet formats defined, um, and they define things such as the uh, diagnostic modes, where um, you can run tests, you can query sensors, you can control outputs. Um, that's the um, main the purpose of the diagnostic bus is from the point of view of a controller off the vehicle controlling the um, systems on the vehicle and for diagnostics troubleshooting purposes. Um, so in these um, these various network formats, there's um, there's some data formats that are used to exchange uh, information, um, and this is done um, in a fairly efficient way to uh, minimize the um, the uh, or to maximize the utility of the uh, low data rate buses. Um, there's sort of two aspects to the uh, defining a data format. One is the uh, scaling limit offset table slot. And um, that maps the uh, data bits or bytes to a meaningful magnitude. Um, so basically, it's what um, you know, a signed or an unsigned number, and the bit width. And it goes even further to um, define fixed point formats, where, for example, an 8-bit value can represent minus 40 to 87.5 in in one half increments. Um, and the parameter reference number PRN is sort of the other half to that, where it takes the it, it um, provides the the units and a label or description. So um, a PRN would include something like a vehicle speed in miles per hour, and then it would reference a slot that would it would, um, it would dictate how the magnitude is uh, represented. So the the slot and the PRN are used to um, there basically have to be um, offboard tables of of when what packets supply which um, what types of value values what's the slot or PRN for values that come back from the vehicle so that um, the vehicle can send back responses inefficiently. Uh, the diagnostic modes, um, variety of diagnostic modes here, um, like I've mentioned before, re requesting the sensor or diagnostic data. Um, you can you can ask um, an offboard device can query the vehicle for um, any particular sensor, what the reading is, or um, diagnostic data, which is perhaps sensor input that's been. Um, process in some way or the results of an onboard test. Um, it's a freeze frame capability where um, certain uh, sensors can store their values at a particular time. Um, you can set triggers so that uh, you can manually control when information is stored where um, if a certain threshold is reached on a particular sensor, then store all these other sensors. Um, also, the freeze frame data is stored um, on some DTCs, the diagnostic trouble codes, when a particular error occurs. Sometimes, automatically, sensors related to the sensor readings related to that error will be stored, so a mechanic won't need to go reproduce the problem. He'll already have a, a bit more information about what went wrong. Um, and as I mentioned before, the scan, the, uh, scan tool example, you can read and clear the uh, DTCs. Um, the uh, onboard monitoring and diagnostic tests. Um, there's uh, 
different, there's continuously monitored and non-continuously monitored systems, which are fairly self-explanatory. One um, just repeatedly runs as the vehicle is running, and the other one is a sort of a one-shot deal. You ask for the value, ask for it to run, and it runs and gives you a value back. Um, and you can initiate the tests and read the results back from the tests. And some of these tests are also run at particular times automatically, and you can read back the results of those automatically run tests. Um, some other diagnostic modes uh, available are reading uh, vehicle information, which includes the VIN, um, calibration data, memory checksums, um, and even more generally just reading uh, and writing memory to the ECUs, um, which can include um, data parameters. It can include code to uh, the runs on the microcontroller that controls um, whatever the, the ECU's function is. So um, what types of existing products are out there? Um, there's sort of a, a, a spectrum of um, the type of functionality and the um, sort of level of uh, integration with the manufacturers in the, the products. Um, there's the hardware um, products that are um, basically you just buy a box and they go all the way to the, the proprietary full interface type things that the manufacturers have. Um, things would be at the dealer. Um, they're very functional. They have all sorts of, um, they can do just about anything that you can do on those diagnostic bus control, just about anything. But <clears throat> they're typically in the uh, tens of thousands of dollar um, range. Um, there's also devices that plug into a PC um, and just provide um, basically a network interface to a PC. And then the PC runs software that um, provides some functionality. Often those are, are less functional. They're more general. So they support um, some common subset across vehicles, but they don't necessarily do every little feature of every vehicle out there. Um, and those usually convert um, some type of serial, RS-232 or USB, into uh, the diagnostic buses. Um, there's also chips, um, so we're getting down more into the low level. There's, there's chips that provide some of these functionality, um, which certainly could be um, the basis for the, the devices. And there's also um, a few designs for um, real simple schematics or kind of hacks on the uh, on RS-232, TIA-232 serial port that will communicate with the um, ISO interface. Um, the ISO interface, um, the bus, again, um, that's the bus that's defined by the ISO, but SAE references it um, sort of um, as a consideration to the European and Japanese car manufacturers that tend to go with ISO as opposed to SAE standards. Um, and that data link layer is um, looks roughly similar to what's a UART a serial, um, serial UART interface. So with just a physical, um, physical layer conversion, you can actually plug a, a serial port on a PC into that. Um, so then with some of these devices that are just hardware that plug into a, a computer, you need software on that, certainly. So um, there's numerous commercial and shareware products. Um, standard support is most common, sort of the common subset that does the most number of vehicles, but doesn't do all the features, the new features of the vehicles. Um, and some of them, there are a few that are uh, manufacturer specific, um, and those are more commonly um, the commercial products. Um, and the, there's one uh, notable free software project called Free Diag. Um, that provides um, basically the basic scan tool operation and diagnostic procedures. It does not go into uh, calibration of um, vehicle-specific things, nor does it really. It, there is some support for diagnostics on some proprietary buses, but there's not not too much support. Certainly not the uh, the spectrum that's available from uh, shareware or certainly commercial uh, software. Um, so um, Open Auto is a project that I've been working on, um, and uh, this is a bit of an overview of, of what that encompasses. Um, I've been working on um, some hardware designs, um, another uh, sort of variation on the, um, the RS2, TIA-232 to ISO bus interface um, to uh, make use of some new chips that are uh, fairly available now, um, fairly cheap. Um, it's, it's somewhat of a... Um, a low part count, um, sort of easy to manufacture design, or easy to put together. I mean, you could, with uh, two parts and samples from uh, a couple of manufacturers, you could, um, you know, put that together by soldering 10 wires. So uh, it's a pretty simple design. Um, I'm also working on um, a repurposed USB serial adapter, I'm basically taking a, um, a key span um, USB to RS-232 interface and um, writing custom firmware that will um, talk not only the ISO out of its... Um, out of its out of its RS-232 connector, which would be fairly easy to do, but also doing the VPW and PWM um, so that you can support all three of the uh, OBD2 diagnostic buses with um, with one device, um, and that's 
Um, that's not complete, but um, I've been uh, working on that uh, the last few weeks. Um, so that's sort of in progress. Um, and software um, is a layer two and a layer three network stack. Um, and some application software. The, um, the network stack um, is uh, in sort of early alpha stage, um, uh, primarily of use to develop, well, really only of use to developers. Um, there aren't, I uh, just have test applications written, no, no scan tools or any um, diagnostic control, but um, it serves um, as a basis, it could serve as a basis for writing such applications. Um, uh, the approach taken by um, all the software packages that I've seen is to basically write um, one single monolithic application that talks all the way to the device, to the user interface, and one single single application. Um, and what I'm trying to, um, my, my sort of theory, um, theory of operation for OpenAuto is to provide the um, a standard network stack type, um, type of software where um, each layer of the of the network is, is a separate piece of software, is a separate library so that you can stack them up and you don't have to duplicate efforts when you want to write a new application. You can build on top of whatever um, standard layer that you're, you're trying to work with. Um, and all of the uh, hardware and software designs are uh, free software released under the GPL. Um, so the network stack, um, trying to go for a, a common API across networks. Um, Currently, I'm working just with the ISO, but I'm planning to support VPW, PWM, and CAN, at least initially, um, and then depending on um, what I can get access to as far as some of the other older buses, um, you know, I hope to be able to support that, at least to have an API that can uh, communicate with those if others um, would be interested in supporting that. Um, it communicates the uh, OBD2 data link layer. Um, there's one for all of the... Um, well, there's, there's one that corresponds to each of the uh, physical layers, so as the physical layers are uh, implemented, so will be the uh, data link layers. Um, and then the network layer, um, initially I'm concentrating on OBD2 because standards are available, um, but manufacturer extensions should be uh, easily um, added if that information can be reverse engineered or otherwise obtained. Um, and the applications, um, these are these are not written. These are these are just in the planning stage. But um, certainly, a scan tool would be like baseline type of device that um, is you know commonly done elsewhere, but would just uh, sort of prove out the um, the network stack. Um, and a network probe and logging tool um, would be things like TCP dump, Nmap, just standard network diagnostic tools that are common in uh, LAN networks, but would be certainly useful in automotive network too. But uh, the automotive network hasn't been really approached as far as a data network. It's more of a um, thought of as, as sort of a, in a different frame of mind, but I don't think it needs to be. So I think those tools um, would be very useful. So I uh, plan to um, get to those at some point. Um, and that way, it sort of help in um, determining some of these um, manufactured proprietary extensions where you can explore unidentified ECUs. If there's some um, ECU that, that never responds to you when you do any of the standard communications, but if you um, you know, if you just go through all the addresses and you can find that it is there, perhaps it can serve some function. So they'll um, let you explore that. Uh, and also explore unknown packet formats. Um, put a sniffer in between uh, um, one of the manufacturer's tools in the vehicle and log all the data and then use that to reverse engineer their protocol and then implement that in OpenAuto. Um, also, uh, some ideas for high-level monitoring and control. Um, where you can expand the diagnostics beyond the, um, the minimal set for uh, OBD2, potentially have some type of um, real-time logging that will just continually as you drive will tell you, um, tell you conditions that are not so severe to cause a DTC to be triggered, but potentially can um, you know, alert you to a degrade, degraded operation of your vehicle before it gets to the point of a uh, component actually failing. Um, logging for you know, whatever purposes, if you want to... Um, for more diagnostics or if you want to tune your vehicle, if you're trying to just de determine performance data, you want to um, generate logging over time to be a convenient way to do that. Um, everything things as well as a configurable UI for a detailed dashboard where you take all your gauges out and you put it in an LCD and then each driver can have their own theme and you know have their own gauges displayed however they want. They can have, you know, someone can have just the speedometer and other people can add the uh, output of other sensors if that uh, you know, suits their driving style. So um, that about wraps up, um, you know, the uh, onboard diagnostics and automotive networks. Um, so I guess I'll open it up for uh, questions or comments. Yep. Um, can you access the CAN bus through the OEDC 
Uh, the question was, can you access the CAN bus through the OBD connector? And yes, you can. The um, SAE standard for that connector also specifies a standard pinout. And that pinout says, um, basically, if you have the ISO bus, it has to be on this pin. If you have the VPW bus, it has to be on this pin, VWM bus on this pin, and the CAN bus on this pin. It doesn't have any other mention of what you would use a CAN for, but it says if you have a CAN, it should be on these pins. Um, so it should be there, and it should be in a standard place. So since the CAN bus is standard, you could potentially have a generic um, sort of network layer there to communicate with whatever you can find on the end of that bus. Other questions? Yeah. The, oh. Sorry. Um, was the question, can you add um, new devices onto that bus? Um, yeah, um, certainly the, um, the uh, open auto architecture is just um, a network stack that communicates on this bus. So if you allocate the address for your ECU to be in the range not for the off-board scan tool but for an on-board, um, in the on-board range, and you don't um, obviously collide with a, a, an ECU that's there, which shouldn't be very hard because there's um, a, a few hundred um, much, I think it's a seven bit number, it's about 128 um, addresses, and most vehicles have less than 10 ECUs, so there should be plenty of addresses to pick from. But yeah, it certainly could be possible to add, a, add an ECU to the vehicle and communicate on that bus. Yeah, sure. Um, if you had a rental car, um, I don't know that there would necessarily be a lot you could tell. Depending, I mean, there could be some with OnStar and some navigation systems. There might be some um, proprietary ways you could look through the history of it. Um, one thing you would b uh, most likely be able to tell is um, with the crash data recorder and the airbags, you could, you wouldn't get a very detailed history, but you could tell if there had been a non-deployment event, basically if someone was reckless driving almost to the point where the airbag deployed but not quite, you could uh, read back um, those parameters, whatever is stored on that vehicle. Um, but other than that, there's not um, not a lot of log no other logging that I'm aware of in the um, you know commonly used in, in ECUs in a vehicle. So there wouldn't there wouldn't be a whole lot of history available, I guess. But um, certainly that could that could change with you know more navigation systems that would give you things like position and time um, information, and also uh, the availability of more storage to be able to just log all that and not worry about um, you know using up storage space. Sorry, Rear? Um, so the question. I guess the, the question was, how can you tell if there's um, some sort of remote transponder on a vehicle? Oh. Those. Um, I guess there's a, there's a number of um, obvious signs of that. Um, certainly, if it has OnStar, that's um, a capability of OnStar to be able to do that. Um, I believe Ford has a similar system that's it's more of a navigation system that has some um, sort of a, a crash recovery feature that's not used for the asking for directions, but in the event of an accident, supposedly it can report your telemetry information for uh, rescue. Um, but those are the only ones that I'm aware of. I mean, there's certainly a number of ways that um, I could probably think of about half a dozen off the top of my head of ways you, you could potentially set it up, set up a, a telemetry um, system on a vehicle. Um, but I don't think, there's no OBD2, there's no SAE standard for that type of system. So um, it's really just, uh, you know, up in the air. It could be implemented any number of different ways. There's not a con, besides the ones I mentioned of the uh, OnStar and, and uh, whatever's Ford, similar corollary uh, system would be. Um, I don't know of any other commonly used systems um, that would do that. I guess um, so that reminds me of um, one more, um, just a little bit about sort of the privacy and the telemetry information. Is the um, so this OBD2 is the current um, standard for uh, that's a federally mandated standard from the uh, SAE for um, automotive diagnostics. Um, there's been some talk about what um, what will be OBD3, what will replace it, um, and I haven't seen anything concrete. I've seen a lot of sort of rumors and discussions in trade journals, but. I have seen, um, the only concrete thing referring to this I've seen is on the uh, California Air Resource Board, which is um, sort of where the EPA gets its direction for um, what eventually becomes a, a nationwide standard. And it, they mentioned that there's going to be a feature, or there's considering a feature that will make your um, vehicle inspections be much more convenient by 
continuously automatically reporting the state operational state of your vehicle to remote transponders such that only the vehicles that are performing uh, under spec will be required for um, required for an inspection so certainly that could be um, have all sorts of privacy implications if your vehicle is all the time or once a month is reporting its information to these beacons around your city or around your town um, you know it could be reporting more than just emissions control data it could be required you know by the time OBD3 comes out it could require GPS in your car and it could have your coordinates certainly have to identify your vehicle and you know I'm sure that someone will eventually find out how to decode that themselves and then you can just track people very easily with that um, that type of system what's that what's that what's your own data what's that <laughs> Certainly, yes. I mean, you could, yeah, you could do that. You know, you could, you could make a transponder that continually just reports, yes, my vehicle is fine, everything's perfect. Um, just kind of get a, a record of what the um, the, the proper operational um, message is, and then just continually play back that forever and disconnect the uh, the real transmitter. So there's um, certainly a lot of flaws in that system, and I'm not sure how much of any of that is being thought out because all I've seen concretely about it from authoritative sources is just a very um, vague comment on the California Air Resource Board site. Sorry, more questions? Yep. Uh, the question was, the ECU stores the vehicle identification number, so what does that do for aftermarket um, mechanics that will swap ECUs for um, vehicles that have been damaged or need to be repaired? Um, that can cause a significant amount of a problem, I'd imagine. Um, I know I haven't seen anything with reference to the VIN, but I know there's a lot of, um, a lot of problems with odometers that um, with when you use a an ECU that has, because the odometers in, in a lot of vehicles nowadays, are, it's displayed on LCD and it's information stored in an ECU um, in memory somehow. And so there are ways to reprogram them a single time or um, certain procedures you have to go through to, to get them to be reprogrammed. And I imagine they'd be similar for the VIN, but I also imagine that it probably would be very difficult because I know that in other, in other um, for more for anti-theft systems, there's um, sometimes there's um, pairing of certain electronic components where certain ECUs will only work with their their corollary ECU um, specifically um, the vehicle I drove the vehicle I drive the um, the there's trouble getting putting in a replacement engine because you have to put in a replacement ECU at the same time you put in a replacement engine um, otherwise it just won't work um, basically you, you can't replace your engine or your ECU separately you have to replace them both together uh, other questions oh, what? Yeah, they can do um, OnStar. They can do all sorts of things remotely, um, which makes it kind of scary. They can they can read back just about anything from the vehicle. I mean, they can start your vehicle remotely over the phone. <laughs> so <laughs> it's um, I actually had a discussion with um, uh, OnStar salesperson one time about the, um, the the some of the privacy and security of that, and their best answer was, "Well, we have a policy." And we train our people well, and I don't know any more than that. <laughs> so uh, personally, I don't trust them very much because I doubt their policy is enough to really do anything in the in the face of something um, something going wrong. And I really doubt that they have too much security on top of um, top of the system to make sure that it's it's hard to uh, you know spoof and, and do bad things. A question. Uh, the question was um, on Bluetooth enabled vehicles nowadays is Bluetooth avail is Bluetooth on the can um, I'm not sure I don't have any familiarity with um, any of those vehicles but I would imagine in, in some fashion there's there's probably some um, interlock there so that um, for example if your your phone rings it can automatically mute your mute your stereo or um, you know perhaps they can do even more sinister things like 
you know, make sure that the vehicle is operating in a particular way or hang up your phone if your car is, you know, steered too erratically or something like that. I mean, I don't know. That's a little far-fetched. But I do think that the muting the audio of a, of a stereo when the phone rings is, is something that would be uh, very likely done. But I'm not sure. I, that's just speculation. I'm not familiar with that. Right, yeah, the comment was that there's um, a lot of aftermarket stereos and, um, and factory stereos have a, a line that's sort of a relay output to be able to control this function, but um, I think that's sort of a more of an old technology way to do it, and, and communicating over the CAN bus with a message it would be, um, I think, the way things are going in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's more of a, a sort of a shared network as opposed to a, you know, a one wire for every function you need. You have you know, a pair of wires for your can all around your vehicle, and that does everything. You don't have to have you know, dozens of wires going back and forth, spidering all through the vehicle. Yes? Um, just out of curiosity, um, do you have any idea how much code is in the software of a typical vehicle and what kind of memory and processing power they have? Uh, the question was um, how much code uh, as far as quantity um, is in the ECUs and what type of processing um, is in it. Um, certainly in, say, five to ten years ago, 8-bit um, microcontrollers was very common and 8 or 32K of uh, memory was very common. Um, I think modern vehicles are um, still use, um, some of them still use 8-bit microcontrollers for a number of functions, um, some of the more enhanced ones, and they also have um, code that's, you know, maybe 3264K, and they also have a number of ECUs. Instead of having one ECU with, you know, 8K of memory, there's five ECUs, and each one has 32K of memory. So they sort of parallel in that sense that there's multiple ECUs, um, each serving separate functions. No, the comment was um, average processor is about 40 megahertz and one to two meg of storage. It's just, it's cell phone, yeah. Now the comment was the newer versions of OnStar CDMA. But I do believe that they do their data in band in their voice channel because the demo I saw, when they, um, they called up the, um, um, the OnStar representative and told them that they were locked, they locked themselves out of the vehicle. Um, since they're calling from the vehicle, the OnStar person said, uh, let me wait, disconnect you for 10 seconds, and they disconnected, the doors unlocked, and then they came back on the line, reconnected the, the voice conversation. So um, I believe that there's probably doing some type of um, audio frequency shift keying through the, uh, the voice channel or, or some other type of modem through the voice channel of, um, of a cell phone. So next year you'll have that in Hopefully. <laughs> Uh, the question was if I heard more about cryptography. Oh, sorry, was there more than that? Um, yeah, so the um, cryptography on the buses, the only thing I know as far as any type of security feature is the security feature in the um, OBD2, and that's really just a, a challenge response type of, um, it gives you a seed and you have to give it back the corresponding key, and those are uh, 16 bits each each way, um, and that's that's the only security that I'm aware of that the vehicles do. I think some of them also um, have a security through obscurity where they have a checksum in an odd place in their memory map and they have an algorithm that people don't know, but it's not really a, I doubt it's a cryptographic secure algorithm, it's just an unknown algorithm. Um, so, because I know a number of people that are reverse engineered different, um, different ones. So if, you know, the, the fewer vehicles that have a particular algorithm on it, the sort of the less interest there is to, um, to reverse engineer it, and um, I mean, I don't know, it's terribly effective, but I think that there's very, very crude, and I mean, it's hard to really even call what they do cryptography. Sorry, another question. Uh, the question was, what type of storage devices do they use? Uh, EEPROM um, is commonly used because they want to, because you need to be able to um, store small amounts of data. You know, you, you don't a flash memory wouldn't be um, sufficient because a DTC is two bytes. Um, you know, some of the freeze frame data is just a few bytes, so um, they need to be able to store 
those periodically and also um, you know share the memory with storing calibration data which is only um, written once in the factory or whatnot so the uh, EE electrically erasable um, proms uh, is what they use other questions yeah. Uh, the question was, have I considered writing it as an OBD device driver? Um, I'm not quite sure what the um, what you're asking, but I think that is basically what I'm I'm doing. Yeah. The um, the the question was, um, or the uh, comment was to have it as a uh, kernel device driver, just like as a network interface, um, like other network interfaces in the vehicle. And and yes, I have considered that. Um, and um, that's sort of, um, I see that as like a later step to what I'm doing now, just because of the ability to um, develop it and and some of the um, some of the, the common reasons why one would want to do that for normal in network interfaces isn't so much of a um, concern for open auto things like performance um, and some of the other integration with the other um, utilities where you're not going to run. Well, I suppose you could. It would be. Um, I don't see what. It wouldn't be a high priority to, to tunnel IP over OBD2, but potentially you could do that if you had something set up, and that might be an interesting thing to play around with. Um, yeah, certainly. That's actually something I've been thinking about, too, where you could have um, some sort of small device on a vehicle that talks OBD and has an Ethernet or something that you can connect through a, you know, a computer in the back of your vehicle or, or tunnel it over uh, 802.11 out to a service shop or something like that. Um, but yeah, I have considered that. Um, but I see that sort of as a later stage to just getting the driver stable because um, there's not a lot of benefit to doing it at this point and just would complicate the development cycle. Other questions? All right. Uh, I guess that wraps it up. Thanks a lot.